When last we left Job, he was throwing a conniption fit because he wanted to bring his case before God, but complaining that God was nowhere to be found. As you will remember, Job was outside the city gates, sitting on an ash heap covered from head to foot in sores, having lost his livelihood and his children. His so-called friends showed up, admonishing him to repent of what has caused all these bad things to happen, which are no doubt God's punishment for some sin Job is unwilling to confess. Job defends himself, maintaining his innocence, and complains all the while about his suffering. And back and forth it goes between Job and his three friends friends for more than 30 chapters, with a fourth young friend in time appearing out of nowhere, but with nothing productive to offer. Job is stuck in his suffering and grief and demanding justice from God. Job and his friends see God's role as that of helping or punishing, and for thousands of years, that notion has continued to be drilled into our psyche. We have been told that God's job is to punish the wicked and help the faithful. There are lousy, selfish, stupid, cruel people all around us, and it would be nice to know of a divine counterbalance. We wonder what's the point of a God who doesn't help or punish. If we have a need, why won't God help us? I've gotten myself into a financial bind, God. Fix it for me. I've received a life-threatening diagnosis, God, and you know I've been your faithful servant, so heal me. We naturally expect God to be as outraged as we are about what we perceive to be evil and injustice. And we expect God to respond the same way. God, that horrible politician, is intent on stealing our rights. Punish him, God, and at the very least, please, oh please, keep him out of office. But God's justice isn't like human justice. Our justice is one that's based on retribution or restitution. Fancy words that mean revenge or receiving money. Human justice means someone's going to get punished for their evil deed. Either that or they're going to get sued. Retribution or restitution. It seems only fair. But God's justice has nothing at all to do with fairness. Instead, it's based on grace. Jesus tried to make that point when he told a parable about the celebrated return of a prodigal son who had wasted his inheritance. And again, when he told the story of day laborers who had only worked one hour receiving the same salary as those who had worked the whole day. God's justice isn't fair. God's justice is based on ensuring that anyone who can will develop into someone capable of leading a meaningful life. In our justice, the victim is made to feel better through retribution or restitution. But in God's justice, the victim, Job in this case, perhaps learns something and grows in depth and compassion toward others. Job has been implying for 35 chapters that God has not been behaving. God has not been acting the way God is supposed to act. So if the book of Job is about anything at all, it's about addressing the question, what or who is God? 
And are we the audience being challenged to distinguish between what we want God to be or even need God to be and what God really and truly is? If God is not the great cosmic punisher or helper, then who or what is God? Rabbi Harold Kushner, author of When Bad Things Happen to Good People, wrote the following in another book of his called Nine Essential Things I've Learned About Life. It isn't God's job to make sick people healthy. That's the doctor's job. God's job is to make sick people brave. And in my experience, that's something God does really well. He goes on to say that prayer is not a matter of begging or bargaining. It is the act of inviting God into our lives so that with God's help, we will be resilient enough not to be destroyed by life's unfairness. And so this morning, God enters the stage, but with an attitude, intent on providing an experience for, jo for Job that will hopefully transform him into someone who is resilient, as well as humble and compassionate. God takes Job on a tour of the cosmos, but first warning him to fasten his seatbelts because it's going to be a bumpy ride. In some of the most phenomenal poetry ever written, God begins the journey reminding Job what God has accomplished eons ago with God's creation of the heavens and the earth. And God points to the weather the rainstorms with its lightning, its clouds, and the tilted water skins of the heavens, all thanks to God's efforts. God is portrayed as both architect of the universe and cosmic maintenance engineer. But God is also the compassionate nurturer, hunting prey for the lion and ensuring her cubs are fed providing the raven with prey and attending to its young ones. Our reading does no justice for the poem which portrays God as both male and female. Who has fathered the drops of the dew? From whose womb did the ice come forth? And who has given birth to the hoarfrost of heaven? For four chapters, God poses one question after another to Job, saying, this is what I have done, and look here, this is what I can do. Can you, can you do this? Job has asked God to explain his suffering, but instead, God invites Job to be mindful of the whole universe. Steve Garness Holmes says Job is given a walking tour of the entire universe in order to reveal that Job is part of it all. Even in his suffering, he is part of a beautiful thing. God lifts him out of his individual experience and connects him with the shared experience of all living things, the whole world. It sounds a bit callous, but God essentially says, look at this amazing world, isn't it cool? And you're going to complain? Your little existence is not the extent of your life. You are part of this whole thing. Expand your consciousness. Garnus Holmes admits that's not a helpful thing to say to someone in crisis. But the book of Job wasn't meant for them. It was meant for us now. God is saying expand your consciousness now so that when suffering comes, you can greet it with the mindfulness of the entire universe. 
not just your one isolated little life. You are a single note in a great symphony. Hear the whole symphony. I will admit that it's a lot easier to hear the whole symphony when things are going my way. It's awe-inspiring to realize that I'm part of the universe. Carl Sagan said, the cosmos is within us. We are made of star stuff. He was referring to the fact that many elements in our bodies, like the calcium in our bones and the iron in our blood, are created in the final stage of dying stars. The elements in our bodies, like carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen were created in stars billions of years ago. That's what it means to be a note in the great symphony of the universe. If we can hold on to that idea, then when life is unfair to us, and it will indeed be unfair, in fact, it probably already has been unfair to you on multiple occasions. But when life is unfair and we can realize that we aren't the center of the universe, but only a part of it, then we have more of a chance of being resilient, as R Rabbi Kushner said, in the face of our suffering. Job wanted to know why God was punishing him. God doesn't answer the question. It seems that maybe that's not the, the role of God, despite what we have been told all our lives, at least according to the author of the book of Job. And if it's true that God's justice is, ba is based on ensuring that anyone who can will develop into someone capable of leading a meaningful life, then maybe this whole tour of the universe was meant to transform Job into that sort of someone. We'll see next week if that transformation happened. But in the meantime, Maybe our prayer should be one that invites God to transform us into the same. And we might start with opening our, ourselves to a world that is bigger than us. One in which we are not the center of the universe. One that leaves us awestruck with wonder at it all. Amen.